The uh, Colombian editorial board is uh, pleased to welcome Jamie Herrera Butler, uh, Congresswoman from Washington's third district. And Angie, I apologize. How do you pronounce your last name? I know it's tricky. Reister. Uh, Angie Reister. Um, <laughs> you, and what is your official title? Communications, Communications director. director for uh, Jamie's office. So and, and thanks to both of you for coming in. Uh, as you know, you've been through the drill before. We are mm -hmm. videotaping this. We'll mm -hmm. post it unedited on our website um, and it, thanks for coming in during um, a little break in the action in Washington DC <laughs> so we'll try and keep this casual open-ended okay. whatever you're interested in talking about and okay. we'll get into some specific issues about Southwest Washington um, great so given that um, I'll open the floor to you and what is top of mind top of mind oh so I would say you know, we've, we've transitioned out from a very uh, hectic and unpredictable couple of months. That's <laughs> one way to say it. And now we're finally able, I feel like, to begin to really focus on, okay, this year and then long term would be next year is kind of how, at least in my office, we organize things. What are we going to be working on? We just did our, our office kind of planning retreat. We do one every year just to lay out possible challenges, things we know where we can make a difference. And um, I think for us, we're going to continue. Economy is always going to be a, a, a big piece because it's, it's without a, a functioning economy, um, everything <laughs> distills down pretty quickly. So making sure that there's still robust growth and opportunities take advantage of that growth. So we've had um, good job opportunities. Unemployment is near 50 year low. Now what's the next challenge that we hear? We hear about making sure that there are jobs and communities that are meeting each need and some of that has to do with increasing apprenticeship opportunities and working with the community colleges and some of the manufacturing for example to make sure that there are certification programs or training programs that get people into the higher wage jobs that are available. So it's not enough just to have jobs available, it's to make sure that people are meeting those jobs. And in some of my counties um, you know, it's a little, it's, it's more challenging than not. Um, so that's a big part of our focus. Um, it certainly will be here. Uh, obviously, the I-5 bridge, and then separate of that, the, the tolling proposal, I think is gonna continue to be a big piece of our focus. Um, I've had a number of meetings with state, or local officials and, and state electeds um, about where they see, going. obviously they're in session right now, so things are moving. Um, and, and about what they see and what they're pulling together and how we can be of assistance. I still think that my main job isn't to say this is exactly what this needs to look like. It is to make sure that there are federal funds available and to make sure, there, and, and I can say if you're going to use these federal funds, that it needs to meet the needs of the people in my community. I mean, that's kind of my, my basic, and that's where I've come down on things like, like rail, um, but that the 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 whole process and the bridge itself is it's going to continue to be a big part of our focus. Um, I think healthcare is going to continue to be uh, an emphasis for me personally. Obviously, in the next <laughs> two years, the math isn't there for a repeal and a replace. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you still can't work and continue to have success in these issues as I have in the last couple of years. Um, and I plan to move forward on that. You know, just at the end, the waning hours of the last session, like three or four bills signed into law, which was an, I mean, for everything else that was happening that I wanted to arrest or change or move, um, I was really pleased to see some of our big efforts make it across the final finish line, not just house passage, but make it in. And I, I have that expectation with regard to health care, pieces of the health care pie in the next two years, um, hopefully to deal with rising costs of drugs and premiums. Um, and a number of those things we already have in the works. Uh, and so I think big picture ballpark in the next year, those are going to be where we spend a lot of our time. I think we've also, one of the areas where I don't talk about a lot. I didn't even know this number until our planning retreat. <laughs> we do a lot of casework. A lot of what I do is helping people navigate ICE, immigration, USCIS, or then the, I'd say the next biggest caseload is probably Social Security. <laughs> and then beyond that's probably VA. I mean, I knew our VA number was around 1,400 veterans that we've helped, but 
just in the last year in terms of casework, we have helped save about 1.8, I want to say $1.8 million in, in helping people get through the process quicker, reducing the number of days they're waiting, getting to people to a, a, a satisfactory place. And I think we'll probably... I'm sorry, that's all VA. No, no, that's okay. that's all casework okay. for the last year. No, it's okay. not all VA. I wish it was all VA. Um, but that's all casework. And I think um, building out opportunities there, just because we're good at it, we don't advertise it, I think, enough. And so one of the things that I came out of that retreat was we're pros at this at this point. I want to make sure that, you know, someone's uncle, just to, yesterday I had a couple come in, say they'd been working on getting their son um, a visa for about five years. And he's he was coming up on a deadline, like it had to happen. And he was a minor, he was a dependent. And I, I was like, five years? They weren't even getting a response from USCIS. Like, no, no, we're, we're looking at it or wait and see, like zero response. And then someone said something and they thought, oh, I'll go ask my congresswoman. And we were able to get it resolved pretty quickly. And I, so then I thought, how many other cases like that? How many other things like that are happening? So I think that's probably the next year for us. Uh, let's back up for a second. You mentioned uh, the bridge and uh, mm -hmm. your role would be making sure that federal funds are available. Uh, what is the, the outlook for that? Uh, do you think, will there, uh, if we ever mm -hmm. come up with a proposal, will there be support in Washington, D.C.? Well, there's a, uh, well, there's two pieces of that pie, right? So there's right now money available in two separate accounts that I've helped fund um, a billion or more for major infrastructure projects. So that's kind of a, that's like, an, those are ongoing pots of money that we need to keep filling in every year in appropriations we do. And that's part of, that's, that's what I, that's my main function is in the appropriations committee. So that will continue. Um, whether there's a big picture infrastructure bill, I assume is kind of more where you're, you know, is there like an infrastructure plan going to move? That's anybody's guess. Everybody talks about it. Everybody seems to think it's a great bipartisan thing to do. Um, nobody's against it, but I don't see the committees necessarily moving in that direction, which is a good indicator. And I'm not sure I'm seeing specific plans not necessarily out of the White House, but out of transportation. So I hear a lot of people think it's a great idea. It has been. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that I'm seeing anybody put make that the number one priority in terms of what they're pushing policy-wise. Well, the, the president has had a couple of infrastructure weeks, but has that In terms of policy, though, right. I haven't seen... That's what I, I haven't gotten... It's not like, here, this is something we're starting to look at. You know, here's right. some things to start chewing on. Um, I haven't seen it from the committees of jurisdiction, although I'm I am supposed to be meeting with Peter DeFazio, who's now the chair. Um, obviously, I'm more going to be talking about our regional stuff, and I can get his sense as to what he's thinking. But again, I'm not hearing. And generally, when it's really going to happen, you s you see that forming now. That's not to say it won't. I am to the point now where anything's possible. I don't make those long-term predictions. You know, I, in the, in the yeah. past, it's my understanding that federal money for the bridge was transit money. Um, will will that be the case again, or will, will there be some construction money? Available? It's totally best guess. It's totally up to whatever the entity asks for. So if it's you know, I say the entity it was the CRC last time. Whatever the entity right. is, it's whatever they ask for. There's money available for all of it. There's federal highways, and they have their, within federal highways. There's there's construction dollars for projects of regional, national significance. There's new start money. There's transit money in certain pots that you can make application for. So there's money for all of it. It's it's completely up. The scope of what they're requesting is completely up to the local sponsors and what they want. And I, I there is money for for my purpose. There is money in those pots. So, for um, and speaking of infrastructure and building things, what could possibly come up? <laughs> I have no idea what's on your mind. Uh, uh, I've only talked to a million people about national this. National emergency to try and build a wall, uh, a wall on yeah. the southern border. Um, 
-hmm. and uh, you issued a statement saying you disagree with that decision. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is that? A couple reasons. Um, I should first say, to make it abundantly clear, I have voted for and will continue to support funding for a physical barrier. I don't think that's in any way, I just shouldn't be news to anybody, that's not radical in my mind. Knowing who's coming and going, I, I think, having met with some of our law enforcement just in this last week on I-5 with regard to drugs and trafficking, it's not a question in my mind that it needs to be done, period. No, but you mean the, the, you're the physical barrier, the yes, and I voted okay. So he, five billion for thirty billion, right. like the, even yeah. though um, experts say that the drugs aren't coming over the border, they're coming through ports of entry. So I think you can find an expert in any area to say just about anything. But I have been taking my kind of marching orders from more of the local law enforcement mm -hmm. who have told me from their personal experience who they're arresting, who they're seeing, and who they're breaking up in the drug rings, and recognizing we're on I five. So we, I I think they're probably a little bit more engaged maybe than, than others because people are like washington state why does washington state care well it goes right through us sure. and i asked that exact question of one of our sheriffs and he directly replied we're having problems because of and i've i've pulled people i have been part of sting operations where we have busted people who have when i've said to them one guy said is this my seventh time doing this and he said where are you getting in and he said i walk across the border so i don't so, so I'm, that's where I'm taking my information from with regard to our region is that they're getting wherever where they're coming, it's not just where, probably not just where the administration says, probably not just where mm -hmm. people who oppose it say. So in any event, I think a wall or barrier, depending on what, you know, if you're in the middle of a river, whatever works, um, will help. I so anyway, I, I'm so, sorry. so uh, I say that to say election. I have voted in that sure. way many a times, will continue to. Here's the difference. Um, President Obama declared 13 national emergencies. So I've had people on the right come to me now and say, how could you oppose President Trump doing this? You never said anything about when Obama did it. And here's the difference. He did 13 national emergencies, and each time he used money that Congress had appropriated for that purpose, right. which is how this works. So FEMA, for example, we, as an appropriator, and under the Constitution, uh, the, the legislative branch appropriates taxes and appropriates that money. That's our role constitutionally. We put that money into a FEMA pot, for example. In order for that money to be used locally, the president has to declare the federal emergency, and it can be used by the governors. Think Sandy, think Katrina, right? That's that's the process that has been agreed upon in statute. The unique thing about this declaration isn't that, it's not to say I believe or don't believe there's a crisis, right? It's not about whether I think there should be or shouldn't be a wall. It's that he is declaring the emergency and they're gonna take money out of a pot that was appropriated by Congress, by the legislative branch, signed into law, set in place from one area, and use it for the wall. That is a constitutional breach. That's, that's a, it's, it's not speaking to <laughs> the validity of the need for the wall. It's that the Constitution is the only thing that separates us or protects us um, as a country for anybody's good or bad ideas, right? What I tell some of these folks is, um, you know, that right now we have a Republican administration. It will flip. At some point, it's going to flip, right? And if Republicans break the precedent that the Constitution <laughs> means something, right, that there is a separation of powers as delineated under our founding document, the highest document in our land, if we say that doesn't matter, and then the next, you know, there, there are several known socialists running on the Democratic ticket right now. What if Elizabeth Warren gets in and says, uh, Green New Deal, climate change is a national crisis, sure. and I'm going to take this money that Congress put in this pot over here, and I'm going to spend it to address this national crisis, or Bernie Sanders, or on, you could pick anything, anything, Medicare for all. Talk about anything, so that the constitutional protections 
um, and the separation of powers to me is bigger than any one single issue. And that's not to be diminutive of the issue. It's just that's that's very core and fundamental to me. So and so um, um, Democrats plan to introduce a resolution to try and overturn the national emergency, and it, I just read they're going to introduce it tomorrow. Okay. Um, it, will you vote in favor of that resolution? I need to see it, but I am definitely going. If it, I will vote to protect the separation of powers, like a, mm -hmm. it's just. That's what people here elected me to do. That is my job. Um, yeah. So I haven't... I'll take a look. At, but at my hope is that... I just think this one is so much more... If you believe in... And too, if you believe in getting the wall built, this is not a fast or quick or easy way to do it. I mean, it's going to be tied up in the courts... This isn't going to get us there. This does not absolve Congress of the responsibility to fund our border security. So it, in my mind, it's, it's a step backwards. Um, so we'll move on. Um, are, are you happy with the, how the uh, tax reform is playing out? So... I think the intended effect was grow our economy, create more jobs, get us out of stagnation, and we continue to be in that place. You know, I was looking over some of the numbers today under the last administration. The average GDP growth was about 1.4%. So the, their best two years were 2.6%. They had 2.6% twice, and most of it was around one6 to 1.9% GDP growth. I mean, it was pretty anemic. And and if you get the further you get, I mean, the second year of 2.6 or second year of their their high high water mark um, was after all the stimulus spending. So it does account for some of that. Um, you know, in the last two years, median household income has gone up by say 33 3.3%, which is the most in. I don't think it's ever. Um, but it's certainly in years. Actually, it's an all-time high to 61, a little over 61,000. Uh, manufacturing jobs have come, we've reshored or brought back from overseas almost 200,000 of those. We have grown between, so I saw a conservative estimate, I'm going to use that, versus the estimate I heard from the uh, State of the Union, which was... Uh, in, in manufacturing, we've not the on the reshored, but just manufacturing growth, about half a million jobs in the manufacturing sector. So more more middle class um, growth. And we've seen unemployment, I think, is at a 50 year low across all almost all measures. Um, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, people with disabilities. I mean, we, we just see that continuing to hold out. And I was looking through the state economic forecast. Um, you know, there, the, the talk of recession is conti just continues to move out, continues to move out another year. And they, I think they've revised, even at the state level, the amount that's coming in due to the tax growth. Um, and this isn't accounting for, because I know Inslee has new tax proposals, so I'm not necessarily accounting for that, but in terms of revenue, uh, it was like $160 million. So we continue to see that growth, which okay, is the so goal. So a couple of things about that. Um, one, um, according to the numbers I've seen, like through Obama's, through the final 18 months of the Obama administration, mm -hmm. job growth was actually bigger than the first 18 months of Trump of the Trump administration. Or whatever. Where did you see that? I, I can dig it up for you. I um, just, but even yeah. aside from that, um, it, it, from what you're seeing, is the average Southwest Washington family actually saving twenty five hundred dollars on their taxes? Well, considering we haven't filed our taxes under the new system, I can't necessarily. Have you heard from people? I have not. I haven't even filed my own taxes. Okay. Well, so. I'll, I'll tell you that didn't happen for me. We're paying a heck of a lot more. And I, I think from what I've heard, mm -hmm. a lot of middle-class families are in the same boat. 
I think you really have to qualify things. If you're going to throw something out there like a lot of middle class families are in the same boat, you have to qualify that, which is why I didn't take a stab at that answer okay. based on well, hearsay. Well, I'll tell you about my experience. Then. Please. I'm paying a lot more. And I would, without knowing your taxes and your financial situation and your pay or bonus or anything included there, it's impossible for me to speak to why that could be. I will tell you that I got a notice from our assessor after the tax, was it last year? Um, telling me regardless of the fact that federal taxes might be going down for people because of state and local taxes, you will overall on your tax bill be paying more. Well, and, and, and so there's a piece there as well that I'd like well, to make in sure. In our case, it's our federal taxes has gone up quite a lot more than. Have you guys? Than the. Well, wage since you're since you're bringing this up. Sure, I, I wrote about it in my ha, call. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I'm always hesitant to ask people this. Yeah. Because it's personal, but. Um, and that's just you were same same amount you're making last year. Everything's it, staying the same. Wait, no raises. The, the uh, my wife picked up some freelance work, so our wages went up. Mm -hmm. But our, our tax bill increased. Federal tax mm -hmm. bill increased eighteen percent. Our wages went up nine percent. So so, you think people? So so I guess what I'm hearing and, and is I'm you don't want to pay more taxes. Uh, uh, no, actually, I don't have a problem with it. I have a problem okay. with what I feel was inaccurate information being foisted upon the people and disingenuous information. I, I understand that. I think if we're going to talk by and large in the county, I can only use numbers that I know I have that are real. I'm not going to use hearsay numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that as people are going to file now, um, they have... I think it's between 70 and 80 percent of the people in this county will file using the standard deduction, which we went we took from twelve thousand dollars for a married couple to twenty four thousand dollars. That's a pretty big tax savings right there. We'll see how, and we will be interested to see what we will. Constituents have to say. I agree, um, but I think we're also going to have to look at some of the data, like actual data over mm -hmm. time. Um, oh, and and that's why when I use these numbers, you talked about under the Obama years, I can tell you the last quarter of his administration, we were at 1.9% growth. Oh, growth has been bigger. Wages have Trump. been yes. stagnant. The average household median income did not increase. We are at an yes. all-time high. All-time high. Yes, and that's accurate. And, and as, it does as, also as stand as to as reason, uh, which is a huge problem. Is probably one of the areas that you and I agree with when it comes to economics. I think we so when, disagree fundamentally with how you get to a better economy. Well, but and, and you said a year ago that um, that the tax cuts would pay for themselves. When is that which, gonna happen? I also said uh, a year for a major economic shift isn't going to give us a full sure. complete picture. No, but so when will it happen? So we look at things in a ten-year window. Right, and you're probably looking at CBO numbers, which I look at. I, I look at CBO numbers, OMB numbers, Joint Tax Committee numbers, and others to try and blend together. CBO doesn't use dynamic scoring. CBO uses the assumption that once they have a tax to spend, it's theirs indefinitely forever. Um, I don't, I don't know that I buy that because they also don't look at any of the growth that takes place and project that. So they only look at it when they lose their tax revenue. They never add in any growth. Take that for what it's worth. In that, in this 10-year period, I can tell you, and I think it's joint tax who will provide the data on this, um, certainly tax foundation, I think joint tax as well. Uh, for every point that's added to the GDP, to the growth, the number I keep using, uh, over a 10-year period, that adds about a trillion dollars. Right. So if you use the assumption that it was a trillion dollars in, in lost revenue, right, then over that same 10-year period, if you maintain a higher growth than you had before, which if it was 1.9% and we're at, I don't know what it is today, but on average we've been well over a point above that. Yeah, and if we great. maintain that, um, yeah. that takes about a decade. So that's just using so the economic theory. Year, that's, 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 go ahead. that's that's the economic theory. You know, I didn't write it. <laughs> um, that's, I gave you several different uh, foundations and or government agencies who use that logic. So I guess 
that's what I said before. I don't know that I'd change that now. Um, but I can tell you people don't want to go back to not making enough to keep up with the cost of groceries. Well, but, but that trillion dollars a year, that's our annual deficit. Not only the debt, but the deficit this year is Well, the trillion is over the 10 years. The know, growth but, but, is an add over the year. But the, the right. that trillion is a 10-year number. But, but the deficit this year is projected to be darn near a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. right. So what do we do about that? Well, I think... I think that you have to look at it holistically. You have to have more taxpayers paying more. You can't have a stagnant economy. You can't cut your way into that, right? I think you have to grow into that. I've maintained this for a while. I think you and I are never going to agree on this. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think we're going to find common ground here. Um, <coughs> but that is my view: is that you in in and, and I, granted now my I have the Obama years to look at and a totally opposite economic theory to gauge it by, and that didn't work. I guess I don't understand why it doesn't, I mean, it stands to reason to a, the average person, if, if that philosophy didn't work, where the government spent more of the money versus the private citizen, why, why shouldn't we be trying something different? Very different, because where we were at, it are it are the entitlement programs were going to go down the the funding for every day i mean everything was in jeopardy everything including the fact that people couldn't even afford you know i mean everybody was baseline it, it, it during those years was can i afford my mortgage can i afford to stay keep my family house can i afford food i'd rather be at this place now where people have expanding opportunities it's just a different we're it's just a different way to approach it and yes, I don't think, yes, yes. maybe we're both going to be in different roles in 10 years, but we will come back together, and you and I will have this conversation. Gladly. Okay. Gladly. Somebody else has a question? Yeah. Or else I'm going to keep talking about taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Please, for the love. Uh, tell, tell us about the uh, maternal health bill. I mean, congratulations oh, on getting that Oh, yes. Out. Thank you. I am super excited about that. Um, so that came out of working, I've been working with Lucille Roy Ballard. We started Maternity Care Caucus a few years ago. And I thought, oh, there's probably a million of these things. There's probably a lot of people already in these. This is not a new issue. And as we got into that, I just kept realizing Congress is doing little to nothing in these areas. And it's a growing problem and it's growing the wrong way. In fact, I first got interested because in the Yakima they had, there was a spat of birth defects. Um, and it was mostly among uh, more uh, probably Hispanic people who were working in fields. Like they were seeing a specific type of birth defect. And as we dug into that, we realized that like regular flour is enriched. It's been enriched for 30 years with uh, folic acid to help with an encephaly. And it's decreased like almost 30, 25, 30 percent since, since that simple enriching of of basic food staples and it's not in that population it's not in corn masa and that was our first big kind of win was we got the fda to move forward with helping get corn masa enriched right huh. as that moved on then we saw it then it just kept unfolding and i think kind of the big enchilada turned into becoming aware of the maternal the maternal mortality crisis i didn't i had no idea until we really got into this. Um, we're 47th in the developed world and we're going the wrong direction. And people don't know. Like, you don't know. I, no, I've met that's people. A maternal mortality? Meaning for, women who for, die right, as a result. Right. The morbidity crisis is even worse. Mm -hmm. The number of near misses is through the roof. Um, and about 60% of those who do pass are preventable. And so in present day modern America, you can walk into the best hospital and it can happen or you can walk into some place in a rural area and it can happen and you don't know why. So for us, it was okay. I mean, as we, as we kind of developed relationships and started working in this space, this kind of came to us and it became a big priority of mine. And we put in place a, and we actually got the funding in, in place before we got the authorization in place. 
but it put in place uh, maternal mortality review committees in each state. They're going to investigate every maternal death, and they're going to, for the first time, aggregate the data and make it all available. It's going to be put together on a nationwide scale so that we can begin to say, why are more women dying and why is the number getting worse every day? Is it true that most of those women are women of color? The, it's a higher percentage of women who die or, or are at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's four, almost four times more likely. Um, but we're seeing similar disparities in, in rural areas. So I think it's different answers in certain areas. But yeah, absolutely. In, so the way they measure it is death per 100,000. Um, in across the United States, it's about 14 per 100,000 for white women. Um, you can break it down by state and region. <laughs> The one that shocked me the most was in New Jersey, which is supposed to be a very progressive state, uh, for an African American, don't give birth in New Jersey. It's almost 80 per 100,000 in New Jersey. It is crazy. It's, it's, and this is 21st century America. And the thing that gets me is most people who are in the age where you're having babies, you're not, you don't need, that's, that's impossible that that's happening. You wouldn't even think about it. Um, and yet we're going the wrong way, and we have been now, I guess, for numbers of years. So we were really pleased. That one squeaked through at the last minute. I could not believe it finally. Stars line. It's very similar with the sea lions. You know, I felt like I could have easily said, I got, it, I got that off the house floor. That's my win. I did my part. Right? A lot of people take credit for that, and that's – go home and talk about that. But on these issues, I, f I didn't feel like it was – getting us anywhere unless we got them signed into law. And so we worked these <laughs> through the final hours, and it was well worth it. Thank you for running that. What, what are your thoughts on the uh, Green New Deal? I haven't read it. I, begun, I have begun. Um, I think it is... I think it... So I don't, without Im impugning the hearts and motives of the people who put it together, because I don't know them personally, I think their heart's probably in the right place. I think it could have a real devastating impact on our country. And that's not to say I don't want to upgrade buildings to make sure they're energy efficient. But just take that piece alone. I read this today. I had a lot of drive time today. <laughs> I don't usually get to read this much. Um, if you just wanted to, in the next 10 years, retrofit or upgrade every building, commercial and residential, it's almost 40000 a day for 10 years. And that's part of the bill? Part of the, that's the one post. of the planks. Yeah, yeah. like right. every, every building. Um, you know, it talked about, you know, everybody having, everybody having, I think, I don't know if it was a family wage or living wage job, everybody having a health care, free child care, everybody having... I mean, those are all things I want. I want every family in my district to have access to those things. Absolutely. But I don't think socialism works. I just don't. I think that there's a lot of good intentions, and it sounds really good. Who wouldn't want those things? But how do you get there? Um, my experience is when the government takes over an area, they see it's a good example. Healthcare has gotten more challenging. It has gotten more expensive more people are waiting in line in this county as a result. Could part of that be because of the administration's efforts to undermine um, if, Obamacare? If you were only looking at it in the last, like, three months, mm -hmm. but certainly not over the last eight years. I mean, a lot the premiums that we're paying now were set, uh, I should say now because we've now rolled over a year. All of last year, the premiums that we paid that were through the roof that people were screaming about because of the Trump administration were set in place in 2017 before any of his proposals got put. So, so no. <laughs> now, again, if we're here forward, you can start looking at those things. But it, it has been falling under its own weight in the counties that I serve. And that's, you know, we talk about the Green New Deal, and I think... We are not, I don't believe socialism works. I think the only thing that has ever worked is when a free people have the right to be master of their own destiny. And again, that's why the constitutional issue with regard to the Declaration was such a big deal to me. The Constitution, the thing I, I, I think is the most, is singularly important in our whole <laughs> experiment, right, our, our democratic republic, 
is that the individual is just as powerful and just as important as the entire federal government, state government, local government, that they have just as much right as, as the big mass does. That's what makes us unique. And out of that, and that's why I support free markets, out of that, people have the ability to grow and thrive and prosper. And, I, and with the, the, what I've seen of the Screen New Deal, it's a totally different focus. It's the government is going to make sure, again, good outcomes. Like, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to have all these things. But I'm the boss. And I just have never, I mentioned the casework. I rarely see a place where we're running it. We, I say the federal government, and we're more efficient, more effective, and people are more satisfied. A quick sidebar. Then yeah, we'll yeah. Like that. Um, hey, you mentioned free market. So hey, are you in favor of the president's approach to tariffs? So I've always said I believe in free trade, but it also has to be fair. In fact, it was a lot of my, my union members <laughs> who have elucidated that to me. Free is only as good if it's a fair and level playing field. Um, this one's definitely challenged me. Uh, I have had to fight the administration on certain areas. You know, I've used this example probably here before. Uh, when the administration moved to put tariffs on uh, steel, I, and it was a Democrat from down in California, had to go to bat to try and get uh, Australia, who is an ally, like, of course we want you to, to go after bad actors who are undercutting our workers and our industry, and our, it's not a fair playing field. But that's not the case with Australia. They're an ally, and we have a good trading relationship with them, and you need to put them on. And we asked, and the administration moved. They put them on their, their exports on a no-tariff list, or they put it back on the level playing field. Um, but with China, which is really the big enchilada I keep using the Mexican food, be hungry um, analogy. But what what is happening with China? I th I do think someone needed to challenge China. And if you talk, you know, I've talked to people who deal in specialty crops, agricultural um, producers, people who rely on um, a lot of trade with China here. And there's, of course, to say, so how concerned are you? Like, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? What's your business? Ex what, what impacts are you being felt? And I can't believe how many of them say to me, yeah, it's costing me more right now. But at some point, someone had to take the long view with China and recognize they're the, they are the bully. They're, they're not playing uh, by the rules set forth. They're undercutting us at every chance. They're stealing intellectual property left and right. They're stealing government secret information. I can't tell you the number of briefings I've been in where I'm like, oh, the U.S. taxpayer just spent X billion or a trillion on something. And it's so great to see <laughs> that just being stolen. Well, but tariffs aren't. No, but that's where he's going designed. for. No, he's, that's what I feel like a lot of what the president is using it for is to bring them to the table on some of these things. Do what I do it this way? I don't know. Like, so, but I say that to say it's that has not been cut and dried with me because I think overall I've been very wary. I don't want to start trade wars. I think that's I think it's ridiculous. I think we need to be encouraging exports. We're very trade dependent. I want to see that grow. Well, and, yeah. and again, that, like I said, that's a quick sidebar. I wanted to get your thought on it's that. It's hard to but, do quick sidebar on oh, trade. I know. But, well, <laughs> but yeah, issues. yeah. They're, and they're very complicated. Um, but I do want to get back to the Green New Deal. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you have problems with that, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, but so, but should Congress address climate change in any way? Oh, I think, I think we have a responsibility <laughs> to the science of making sure our resources mm -hmm. are healthy. I mean, I've, I've worked on an ocean acidification um, piece of legislation with Derek Kilmer. Um, so, yeah, do I think that we should mandate, we should set the bar for the car everybody should drive, or, or we should say this is the only way, you know, do I think we should eliminate all air travel in favor of mass transit? No, absolutely not. And that is a plank or one of right. the bars. What's, yeah. I read it today. It's specifically called out in the Green New Deal. Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah, of course, 
we have a responsibility to clean water, then clean what air. Would you what, well, what steps would you add? First and foremost, I would say we absolutely have to go on guard and protect our hydro system. There are people in our state, including political leaders, but a, there's a growing movement to breach all the dams on the Columbia Snake River system. And what people don't realize is that's almost 70% of the power for this region. It's carbonless. No energy source is, is going to have zero impact. Sure. So you're, what you're shooting for is what can we get the most bang for our buck sure. for, right? Um, that's one of the, it would take almost 16 coal fire plants to replace that whole system. <laughs> so the people who want to breach it, the other piece there is, you know, who really pays the price for that are the middle and working class people because they are rel more reliant on the manufacturing jobs that require reasonably priced energy. So whether it was introducing legislation, I don't know if we're going to, I know we haven't redone it yet. This Congress, I get, get screwed up in the, the timing, but, um, just to put hydro, hydro uh, power as, as on par with other renewables. I'm not saying give it a tax credit or attach money to it, but don't hold it as a disadvantage. You know, we were selling our hydro power to Canada and they were using it in their renewable uh, resource portfolio and getting credits for it and we weren't. Right. That's nuts, absolutely nuts. So I wanna protect against breaching those dams. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. I have been supportive of so I think our role in the energy development space is in the development piece, the R&D piece. You know, I've seen some awesome proposals with regard to turning pond scum into petroleum and, you know, solar, geothermal, certainly wind. I think they all have a place. My beef, and I've had this with regard to soy, <laughs> right, is subsidizing something once it gets to market and it, it so then you're picking the winner and the loser. Then it's not a free market. Then it's not based on what the best quality product is. It's based on who got the subsidies and who made the place and who really got on the government dole. My thought is I believe in the technological advancement. I think we can get there. Let's, let's, let's provide incentive to get us to better energy sources. Yeah, and to combine the two, aren't the president's tariffs picking winners and losers? Because he has targeted certain industries and not others. Well, he's trying to level the playing field. There's a difference. And I don't pretend to know all there is to know about steel, for example. Right? We have Steelscape. I am very attuned to where they get their steel and the 300 plus jobs that are connected, right? Um, and certainly those who rely on products that use steel. But from my understanding of that, um, and with China, they're, so so what we can import at a high price, they can send in for a low price. And that has to do with um, our entire, there's several different countries where <laughs> basically it's least common denominator. They can all raise their tariffs on what we're sending, on, what, on our exported goods, and yet we have to keep them at 2 3% for many of the different things that they're sending in. China being one of the most egregious actors, in addition to the fact that they're not a good faith player. They're subversive. So, then, um, so, so I think you have to level that. And I th he's using trade to do that. I do expect him as, as more the foreign diplomat, the commander in chief, to take on some of these countries. But, it, but it, uh, don't you think that he's trying to prop up coal and trying to make coal a winner through I have not. various tariffs on other industries? I have not followed that. Okay. I mean,. I had the last remaining coal fire plant on the west coast. Yeah. They got targeted and shut down, and those 400 jobs went away. So I have not immersed in myself into that. So and, and overall, just to, to, mm -hmm. I think I ask you this every time. If, if the election were today, would you vote for Donald Trump? I certainly, I, I am certainly, yeah, I think so. If it were held today, right. with, with, a, with, with some caveats. There are uh, investigations outstanding, mm -hmm. right, that I have said to everybody and their brother at this point, you know, I want to follow where those things lead. So I'm not saying there's a blind mm -hmm. uh, loyalty there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that's going to weigh into that is who's running yeah. in the race. You know, I when I think about a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren or so on and so forth, that makes it a pretty easy decision. Do you, deep down, do you hope 
that a viable deep Repu- down why are we getting that, into personal that feelings a, <laughs> that a viable republican challenges him in the primary i have given it not two seconds of thought okay like i said i'm so i have learned i'm not thinking that's why that election question to me is <laughs> a, a lot could change between now and then right. um my crystal ball has significantly limited to like what's going to happen next week and what do I have a read on and control over and a lot some of it is I can instigate and some of it is reactionary but I haven't I haven't sat here and thought I wonder who's going to run I have to say I'm surprised because you didn't vote for him Mm -hmm. but now you would and to me Uh things I said I'm open I haven't I haven't guaranteed it as far as a lot of anyway well I think I think I guess it depends on what you think has gotten better and what it's gotten better. And I think it's going to depend, too. You know, for me, you know, my district, I, I wasn't sure where my district was going to go on that. That didn't change my personal vote. That's my personal vote. And I still look at it that way. I've had a lot of people be very upset with me because I used my vote that I would have regardless of whether I had this job or not to do what I wanted to do. I still hold it as my vote. Um but I am listening and watching and trying to understand where this district is. They went for Trump in the last election, warts and all. You, I mean, because I think that's kind of your point is, well, you see it all, you know it all. Well, and now, How could that change? Has- well, I think the bat. I mean, it's all. I think I think the stuff that I had a. You so know. In that way, you don't you, think much has changed. <laughs> oh man, that's so difficult. I guess, I mean, this is probably right here, right now, the most I have put into the 2020 election. So, you know, in terms of where I'm going to be on it. So I'm kind of sharing with you (laughs) open air. Um, But I think the things that caused problems and consternation have been out there now, it's, it's not an unknown thing. I mean, this district voted words and all, knowing I think is probably about as bad as you can get, notwithstanding what may or may not come. I don't know. Now, do I think giving it to an Elizabeth Warren, I mean, that's gonna, that's gonna play into my decision big time. Yeah, it's difficult not knowing who, who else would. Um, okay, speaking of crystal balls. <laughs> there, I agree. There, I only is, have... Uh, I am going to bring a magic eight ball next the, time. Look into that crystal ball there. Okay. There have been rumors, there's been speculation that you will not seek re-election. Can from you who? From a little birdie. From whom? From, well, from the, what is it, the Democratic, can, it, one of their, their, their election... Their campaign arm. Yeah. The Democrat Congressional... DCCC. Democrat Campaign Congressional Committee. Okay. They, used, they started a rumor that I'm... I don't know. They, they just... You were on a list of possible Republicans who will not seek re Can you quash that rumor? I can right? quash that rumor. Okay. Hopefully I'm going to break seek. their hearts. Um, definitely. definitely. Seek yes. Okay. Yes. Um, although I think... It, this is smart. I also, I think, a couple of weeks came out on their top 20 list, their targets. Oh, okay. So now this is just backfill. This is to begin sure. the, this is the beginning of the political season for... Does it ever end? It used to. I know. It's this is strange. a new world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, I'm the only Republican on the West Coast, Canada, and Mexico. So, um... But, um, so we have it on the record that you will definitely seek re-election mm-hmm. in 2020. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else we need to touch on? Um, I think we're good. Just want to make sure. Yeah. I think we're good. Angie, you Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Jamie, thanks for coming in. Yeah, my Appreciate pleasure. It. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.